OK. Hi, so uh, my name is Sarek, and I'm going to be talking today about how we can use the 21 centimeter hydrogen line to determine the galactic rotation curve and some of the structure of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so first off, why do we care about galactic rotation curves? So basically, uh, rotation speed can tell us about mass. We know this from simple Newtonian mechanics. Uh, if you have a planet going around uh, a sun, then its velocity is given by this equation, where m here is the, the mass of the sun. Uh, in our case, since we're working with a galaxy, we have spread out mass. This m is actually going to correspond to basically the mass contained within the orbit. Uh, so you know, using uh, a formula like this, you can, uh, given uh, the, the mass distribution that we see in the Milky Way galaxy, we can guess what kinds of velocities we should see uh, various things rotating at. And we can plot that, uh, and we get a curve that looks like this. But we actually, uh, as we'll see later when we go ahead and observe what uh, velocities uh, stars are really moving at, we'll actually see a huge discrepancy between what we would expect from the visible matter that we can see. Uh, and basically the way that uh, we might be able to explain this is possibly there's matter out there that we just can't see. Uh, and uh, physicists uh, term this matter as dark matter. So uh, what we're going to be working on uh, in this experiment is trying to uh, be able to actually plot this uh, rotation curve. Uh, and in uh, being able to show these discrepancies, this will kind of motivate new physics. Uh, so how are we going to find these, uh, this rotation curve? Uh, so the way we're going to be looking at the velocities of various stars is using the Doppler effect. Uh, this is, uh, in our case, this will be a non-relativistic Doppler effect. This is simply just as, a, as an object is moving towards you, uh, the frequencies that it emits are slightly higher than, uh, than if it were standing still. Um, so we can look out at the stars. Uh, um, but looking for optical light doesn't work too well because it suffers absorption from uh, other stars inter, uh, or interstellar gas and dust. Uh, so instead, we prefer something in a slightly lower frequency range, uh, around like the radio, radio emission range. Luckily for us, hydrogen actually exhibits an emission uh, in this lower frequency range, uh, particularly, er, yeah, um, particularly at this 21 centimeter line, and this occurs. Uh, as a spin flip transition. So when the, the, uh, the proton and electron go from being aligned to anti-aligned, that's a slightly uh, lower energy state, and so it releases a little bit of energy. And we can uh, look at that energy coming from the sky. And by seeing how that frequency shifts, we can deduce the velocity that the emitter must have been moving at. So this is the apparatus we're going to be using for uh, detecting our, um, our various emissions. Uh, the, the actual telescope itself is a parabolic dish, uh, which takes an incoming light, reflects it uh, onto this feed horn, uh, and then that uh, signal is fed into this uh, fairly complex circuit. Um, I'll just point out some important things. Uh, the, the signal comes in, it gets amplified, goes through this bandpass filter, that's just to get rid of any frequencies we absolutely don't care about. Uh, and then one important point is that it goes through this image rejection mixer. And what that does is it multiplies the incoming signal by uh, a signal that we manually put in of 1420.4 uh, megahertz. That's the frequency of the 21 centimeter line uh, that we're looking for. And as you can see from this trigonometric formula, uh, multiplying two uh, signals is actually equivalent to just producing uh, one signal whose frequency is the sum and one who's the difference. Uh, and by using the second bandpass filter, we can eliminate the sum and just be left with this signal, which is the difference. Uh, and so the reason we do this is just to get a very precise measurement of how, uh, how off the signal we're seeing is from the 21 centimeter line we would expect from a still observer. And using that, we can figure out what velocity uh, the emitter is moving at. OK. Um, and so in order to uh, turn this into sort of temperatures is what we'll be dealing with. Uh, we're going to first have to calibrate this with a noise diode. Uh, what this will do is just uh, send a signal to, to the feed horn um, that looks like uh, 115 Kelvin black body all throughout the sky. Uh, and so it uses the, the signal it sees from this uh, to uh, extrapolate uh, other signals that it'll see. Um, so basically, if, if later on it sees a signal that's twice as strong as the signal it saw in, in its calibration, at some specific frequency, then it says, oh, there must be a 230 Kelvin black body at that specific frequency. 
So it, at the end, we'll be getting some sort of temperature profile as a uh, function of frequency. Um, and we're going to be taking measurements all across uh, the galaxy. Essentially, our galaxy is uh, mostly shaped in a, in a planar disk, so we'll be just looking within that disk. Uh, um, the, the galaxy has some central bulge with some spiral arms coming out of it, uh, and our sun is located down here. We will be sweeping from uh, the galactic longitude of zero, which is directed towards the center of the galaxy, out to uh, 180, which is directed away from it. So we'll be looking at the first and second quadrants. Uh, as we'll talk about later, these first quadrant measurements will be used to determine the rotation curve, and the second quadrant, measure, quadrant measurements will be, determined, will be used to determine the structures of the galaxy. Okay, so uh, as we mentioned before, um, given a frequency, we can turn that into a velocity using our Doppler shift uh, via this formula, the, this uh, 120.4 it, or 1420.4 megahertz is just the emission, uh, the uh, frequency of the 21 centimeter line. Uh, this right here is just the speed of light. Uh, and then we have this VLSR. This is just uh, our velocity with respect to the sun, just to factor out any revolution that we have around the sun. So, what, uh, so this V observed is actually the velocity with respect to the sun, not with respect to us. Uh, and so now we can use this velocity uh, using you know, various uh, trig formulas, law of sines, uh, we can relate the velocity we observe to the actual velocity of the, um, of the, the uh, star in question. Uh, and note here, we, we have to use this critical assumption that uh, the stars move in circular orbits, which is uh, fairly close to accurate. Um, but using this assumption allows us to say that the velocity of the, par of the star is at a right angle with its radius. Um, and then if we know the radius at which the star lies, then we can use this formula to uh, relate the velocity we see with the velocity of the star. Uh, and here we're going to be taking r naught, which is the distance from us to the center of the sun, to be 8.5 kiloparsecs, and theta naught, which is the, uh, the, our, our speed within the galaxy, to be 220 kilometers per second. Uh, these numbers are uh, not, not too well known, but these will be the values we'll be using, uh, and the literature we'll compare against will be using these same values. Uh, right, and so this, this formula is all well and good if we actually know what radius the, the star is at, but a priori we don't know that. So the trick we're going to be using here is actually just to consider the maximum velocity that we see. Uh, and the, the maximum velocity will occur at the mini minimum radius, uh, and that's simply given by this r naught sine l. Uh, and so if we uh, specifically consider that minimum radius, then this formula allows us to relate that maximum velocity to the velocity of the star in question. Note, however, that this only works for uh, longitudes less than 90. That's in the first quadrant I was talking about before. And that's simply because uh, if you're looking at um, stars which are further away from the center of the galaxy, then uh, they're all just going to get further and further away. There's no, not going to be any minimum uh, radius. Right, so, uh, so we wanted to determine uh, this maximum velocity. That's equivalent to determining a minimum frequency. So how are we actually going to get that minimum frequency? Uh, so uh, as we said before, we have this temperature spectrum as a function of frequency. We're going to start off by trimming off the edges. Uh, there's just a very quick fall off uh, just from the bandpass filter there, so we have to get rid of those. Um, and at each, at each given longitude, we take about 40 trials, and we average that into one uh, one uh, temperature spectrum. Uh, so this is what our spectrum looks like. We're going to fit the first few bins to a linear background. Uh, and we can see that the background fit is quite good for these uh, initial points. You'll notice here we have this annoying little peak here. This actually shows up in most of our plots. Um, this, this is probably because of just some constant source that's creating noise. Uh, so when we fit this background, we just ignore those points in particular. Uh, but for the rest of the points, the fit is quite good. Uh, then we're going to look at, uh, find the first point which exceeds this background by some fixed amount, 1 Kelvin. Uh, and we say that that is going to be our minimum emission frequency. So in this case, this is this 1420.4494 megahertz. Uh, and we can estimate the error on this method by basically fudging this 35 number. So see what happens if we use the first 20 bins 
uh, versus see what, what happens when we use the first 50 bins instead. Um, and so the, the number we get out of it will shift a little bit up or a little bit down. In this case, it shift, uh, shifted one bin up and two bins down. And so that gives us an error on uh, what this kind of method will uh, give for a minimum emission frequency. And by default, if, if, this, uh, if shifting around this 35 number doesn't change anything, then we'll just say that the, uh, the error is just the bin width itself. Great. So uh, using that minimum emission frequency, we can find a velocity as per the formulas uh, I had on a few slides ago. And we can also get the radius uh, simply as a function of the galactic longitude. Uh, and we can plot it out. And we'll get a curve that looks something like this. Uh, so this red curve that I'm plotting here is a curve I found in the literature um, from a uh, paper by Clemens. He, he fit a, uh, um, a piecewise polynomial to his observed data. And so we're comparing it to that. We see actually um, that, the, that the later values, uh, the higher radii actually agree quite well with the literature. Uh, we see a little more disagreement with the lower values. Uh, this can be for possibly a few reasons. One could be, uh, you might have seen in that plot I had before, uh, the, the, um, the uh, temperature starts to rise much slower. And so it's harder to find an emission frequency for these higher values. There's a much sharper jump. Uh, secondly, um, uh, the actual frequencies that you need to move this, uh, these points up to this line uh, tend to be outside of our frequency window or where that uh, annoying little noise was. Uh, so that's just a, somewhat of a limitation of the apparatus. And then uh, the third is the, the circular orbit assumption. Uh, for, smaller frequent, or for smaller angles, this assumption becomes more critical. And so even a small shift in angle can uh, make a much bigger difference. Uh, so we see, we see if we look just at the later points, we actually get a pretty decent chi-squared uh, of 13.4. Uh, so yeah, this, this agrees fairly well with the literature. So then there's one more thing that we, we want to try to, uh, what, try to look at uh, using this 21 centimeter line. And that's going to be the galactic structure of the Milky Way. As we talked about before, uh, we know that the Milky Way has like spiral arms. So we're going to try to see if we can look out and find those, uh, those structures. Uh, so in order to do this, we specifically need to assume some sort of galactic rotation curve. So we're going to be working with the one that we found in Clemens. Uh, and using the formulas before, we can uh, use this given curve to solve for a specific r given any observed velocity. So now we can uh, associate, um, associate radii with all the velocities that we see. Uh, and of course, this is just the, the radius from the center of the galaxy. What we actually want is the distance from us uh, in order to be able to plot this. So we can, we can make that quick change here. Um, and, and now note that this only really works for galactic longitudes greater than 90. Uh, those are things in the second quadrant, uh, simply because if we look inwards to the first quadrant, there are two possible solutions. Um, uh, like along the same line of sight, you can find two different points that have the same uh, distance from the center. Uh, and again, we're going to uh, fit these uh, to like a linear background. Uh, now with like 25 initial bins and 10 final bins. Uh, and we're going to say the temperature above the background uh, multiplied by the, the distance from us squared. Uh, this is just because of a, an inverse square power law. Um, we're going to say that that gives us a sort of relative measure of how much hydrogen must be there. Uh, and as a result, how much uh, emission that we're seeing. So we can use these methods and sort of plot out a uh, vague plot of what uh, the second quadrant of the Milky Way galaxy looks like. Uh, so you can see here, uh, there, there are two sort of spiral lines. We can see one much closer to us, and then one forming out around here. Those actually correspond fairly well with this Perseus arm here, and then the outer arm further out here. Uh, you might notice that as we get up to higher longitudes, uh, the points start to become larger. Here the points uh, denote the the strength, the, the, yeah, the, the like relative amount of hydrogen that we would see in a region out there um, based on the, the temperature above background. Uh, and so as you see, you might see here that as we get out to higher longitudes, uh, we start to see it blow up a little bit. We don't believe that this is uh, a physical um, consequence. 
or, like, it, this is actually physical. This is more just a limitation of the apparatus. Uh, so in conclusion, we were able to use this 21 centimeter technique uh, to derive the rotation curve of the Milky Way, and we saw pretty good agreement with the literature for large radii. Uh, in particular, we saw there was a constant velocity function as we went out to higher uh, radii, and that disagrees with the theoretical prediction. And so this really necessitates uh, some sort of dark matter, which, which can compensate for the discrepancy. Um, we were also able to see some of the Milky Way structure by looking at the exterior points. Uh, and in particular, we saw two spiral arms in that second quadrant. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank my partner, Toby, for all his help throughout the semester and uh, on this particular experiment, some last minute data collection. Uh, I'd like to thank the, thank the 813 staff for all their help throughout and instruction, and then MIT for offering this course. Yeah. Uh -huh. Why do you expect the background to go up towards the humanity? It seems like, at least in good theory, to stay constant across all humanities. Um, so I think this is essentially because of the, uh, you, would, you would expect the, the temperature that you see from a black body to go like uh, Planck's law, or uh, his like formula, right, the, the black body spectrum formula. Uh, but essentially what we're doing is we're very, zooming in on a very, very small part of that, like specifically around one frequency. And so in that region, it's linear. Okay. So this is why we're expecting some sort of linear background. Okay. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> what, what uncertainty do you find here in your Um... So for the rotation curve, um, the uncertainty in the, I mean, the, yeah, I guess there should be some like Poisson uncertainty in the temperature counts. Uh, for the rotation curve, that's not as important because what we care about is the, the frequency at which it occurs. Um, I guess for the, for the galactic uh, structure, you, you really could put some uh, uncertainty on that. And it would just be uh, like square root of n Poisson 